Hi guys. It is a gloomy gray day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in what's left of the paradise of Garfield, Texas <coughs> on this gray <coughs> Tuesday morning I believe March 3rd, 2020 and this is Sam Mitchell and you have found your way to Collapse Chronicles and this is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza, doing what we do every day, which is chronicling the collapse of a planet. And before I get into today's chronicle, I really do want to send out huge thank yous to two very kind-hearted <coughs> listeners, Connie and Mindy, for their very kind support of my work here on YouTube and... Uh, just to let you guys know, for the next three months, 100% of my income is coming for the kindness of my listeners to uh, throw me a Sancho Panza and I a bone every now and then. And we really, really do appreciate anyone supporting our work on YouTube. <coughs> and with that out of the way, uh, and the little dog out of the way. No, you're not going to get the squirrely in the cottonwood tree. You're going to stay here. Uh, two of you have sent me this link from, of all places, the Weather Channel. I have no idea why the Weather Channel was running this story, but good for the Weather Channel. This is a long article, or should I say a short book, written by journalist Matt Hongoltz Hetling called Dance of the Dying Whales. <coughs> this family of endangered North Atlantic right whales has danced away from extinction for decades. Now climate change is pushing them over the edge and this is a long involved piece that stretches all the way from 1985 to uh, last year following uh, one pod of whales, one family of these critically endangered North Atlantic right whales. Uh, and I heart, I'm going to put the link on here and I heartily encourage you to read this whole thing which would take me well over an hour. So I'm just going to give you a warning. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Uh, I am going to read, we're going to go <coughs> towards the end. Uh, we're going to move up to 2010. We're going to pick up the story in 2010. So we've already, you know, fast forwarded for the first 25 years. So if you don't want to hear the end of the story, stop listening now and go read the story yourself. But uh, since the end of the story, well, it hasn't quite ended, but you can figure out the ending. This is, we're going to pick up in 2010 as the family of whales is now in its dance of death. The Dance of Death. <clears throat> Captain Clayton Morrison, dressed in oil skins and eight feet tall if he was an inch, stood on the stores of Gloucester, Massachusetts, gazing out at the roughening sea with eyes of cold bronze. On the concrete pedestal beneath his feet, a small plaque remembered with biblical clarity, They that go down to the sea in ships referring to fishermen who died while whaling or fishing the wind-roughened waters. And on Friday, September 10th, the waters began to roughen once again, driven into long, low-cresting waves by a sustained wind from the northwest. If the statue's hard stare could penetrate 15 and a half miles of sea spray, it saw a whale fouled in a fishing rope. A group of nearby whale watchers noted with concern that the whale, named Trilogy, seemed unable to eat and in poor health. 
by then Trilogy, once perfect and unblemished, knew the ropes all too well. Previous entanglements left her with a series of scars on her face, three on her left lip, one on her chin, and another between her upper lip and her rostrum. Nine more entanglement scars marked her peduncle's ridge, and three larger ones were on her left, upturned tail fluke. None of those entanglements had killed her, but the ropes now binding her would be a greater challenge. A fishing line looped tightly over her nose and snaked into the left side of her mouth. As in days of old, a whale hunting ship raced to sea, full of land people brandishing long, lance-like poles with sharp blades on the end. But instead of sawing through whale flesh, this ship's occupants, a rescue team from the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies, plan to saw through the ropes and free Trilogy. As Trilogy labored on through the water, the skies got cloudier and winds began gusting at up to 21 miles per hour, creating deteriorating conditions. The rescue team was forced to return to port hoping to get another chance in calmer waters, or that Trilogy would manage to slip the ropes herself, or learn to live with them. But the next day, there was no sign of Trilogy. Months passed. She was not, as, not seen again that year, nor the next, nor the next. For the true whales of the ice, the dance of birth involves blood and newborns in roiling waters. The dance of life affirms the joys of conception. The dance of plenty has coordinated swoops through feasting grounds. They also have a dance of death. When whales feel the ropes embrace, they thrash spasmodically like a bucking bronco. In most cases, they tear themselves free or break the rope, but sometimes the lines turn their great strength against them, burrowing deep into their flesh, muscle, and bone. When the rope cannot be dislodged, the whales either die or struggle on, towing fishing gear behind them, possibly for years. In the old day, the hemp halters had been easy to break, but now, no matter how they heaved ho, the nylon lines, which have gotten even stronger in recent years, were implacable. One entanglement deformed a whale named Baldy's 2009 calf so that his tail flukes nearly touched each other in his swimming motion suggesting that he suggested that he had suffered a spinal injury. A recovery would have been a miracle and a quick death a mercy. But the little calf got neither. He labored along struggling to feed and covered in parasitic whale lice, a sign of poor health he was seen for the last time in Cape Cod Bay 15 months later. <clears throat> a whale named Starboard had an entanglement scar on her belly, a second on her chin, a third on her jaw. Peanut, now 18 years old and about 48 feet long, had white scars running down his body at the base of both flukes and on his face in front of and below his bony dipped nose and on his upper jaw. And the rate of scarring was increasing. <clears throat> After a promising 2009, in 2010, the whale actuarial charts suddenly became unsustainable seemingly because whales in search of Calamus, not sure where what Calamus is, I guess an island up there, were running into ships and fishing gear in unexpected places and dying. Though Trilogy, 
was in dire straits the last time she was sighted. She may still be out there somewhere. It's possible. Anything is. When their food disappeared from the main coast in 2010, some of the hungry whales stumbled upon the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the north off the coast of New Brunswick. Here they discovered dense clouds of Kalanus, perfect for feeding. Less obvious was that the Canadian government had no restrictions on ship speeds or fishing lines in place to protect them. I'm, I'm sure this word Kalanus was defined earlier in this story. I do not even know if they're talking about something to eat or a geographical location. But anyway, uh, less obvious was that the Canadian government had no restrictions on ship speeds or fishing lines in place to protect them. In July of 2017, an NOAA airplane flying over the Gulf of St. Lawrence spotted a 26-year-old whale floating 26 miles east of Misku Island, surrounded by sea seagulls. It was Trilogy's younger brother, Peanut. Just like land people, whales have tympanic bones. About three inches in length, they curl like a conch shell around the inner ear. Peanut's right tympanic bone was fractured when a ship broadsided him behind his right flipper. When a boat responded to the scene, scientists found that internal bleeding had coated his thoracic vertebra in clotted blood, partially cooked by the heat of his dying body, his organs were spilling out of his mouth. His corpse was sheathed in a healthy five inches of blubber, a sign that he had been feasting on Kalanus in the weeks before his death. With Baldi's last sighting in early 2016 and Trilogy presumed dead, Peanut's 2017 death left only starboard, starboard daughter of Trilogy, who, despite having just one good tail fluke, had grown to maturity and was ready to push back the darkness by mating for the first time in her life. <clears throat> A few weeks after Peanut's death, as starboard fed north of the coast of Prince Edward Island, she ran into a white rope. It hung from a plastic buoy at the surface and extended 330 feet down to a large metal cage. The cage, a Canadian snow crab pot, was dragged up off the bottom as starboard, young and strong, fought the rope, trying different tacks. The rope encircled her right flipper then ran across her belly into the armpit of her left flipper where a white boy impeded her ability to paddle freely. As her stress level spiked, the ropes chafed her skin, cutting deep around the right flipper. But critically, she was still able to swim. She pushed on for eight miles, dragging boy and trap through waters rich in both Kalanus and death. Sometime later, in slightly shallower waters of 240 feet, a green rope from another trap got snagged on the white rope, adding weight to Starboard's right flipper. No matter how she tried, <clears throat> she could not overhaul the lines and soon both ran into her mouth gagging her. They looped tightly around her beaky nose and her lower jaw, rubbing away the skin off her face. Though she was increasingly desperate, there was hope. If the land people noticed her, they might be able to send out a rescue mission to cut the ropes. In the meantime, the more starboard fought, 
the worse things got and she blundered into still more fishing gear. Before long, she was encumbered by three different sets of rope, four boys, and four crab traps. The rope now formed a webbed network around her left fluke, rubbing neat triangles of skin away from the leading edge. The weight of the gear hanging from her right flipper caused the rope there to saw through her skin and her blubber. Soon it ground down through her cartilage and began eroding her right humerus bone. No one knows how long Starboard struggled. He's off to get the squirrely. No one knows how long Starboard struggled, though the beginning formation of scar tissue beneath some of the rope suggested that she lasted as many as eight days. In the end, Starboard, daughter of Trilogy, sent up one last exultory peace sign, then the overwhelming weight dragged her down for the last, the last time. Yep, and I guess that's the end of the family, but uh, he has kind of a P.S. Uh, here uh, called Calving Grounds. In February 2018, in the calving grounds off the Florida coast, a single whale drifted through an ocean of memories. He was 32 years old, firstborn son of Rat. He had lost three of his five siblings, and his scarred old mother had not been seen since 2005. Nameless though he was, Rat's firstborn was notable because he was the only whale sighted in the calving grounds that year. Any calls he made went unanswered, where once dozens of mothers d nuzzled dozens of newborns, now there was only water. Up north, food was scarce, and ships and fishing lines were everywhere. In 2017, before the bloodletting, there were only five births. This year, in 2018, there were none. In the years since, Baldy first brought Trilogy into a world of promise and hope, the warming of the ocean has changed the calving grounds in other ways. Rats firstborn swam past the once magnificent Oculina banks, now mostly reduced to a coral rubble rocking ghost-like in the tides. The reefs were first bashed apart by illegal trawler fishing, then poisoned by nitrogen runoff, and finally bleached by ocean acidification. The water temperature in the calving grounds has gone up by half a degree since the 1950s. In 1987, that caused massive die-offs of the forests of spiky staghorn corals and of the seagrass meadows that once supported the grazing green turtles. In 1997 and 98, a warm water parasite known as Brutnella hostilis began infecting the brightly colored fish that used to dart among the coral, in each case damaging their gills until one by one entire populations suffocated to death. Up the coast, in the Great South Channel, a 1.6 degree temperature increase was driving out the cold water juvenile cod and lobster. In their place were smaller invasives like blue crab and scup, as well as more infectious diseases. And further north yet, in the Gulf of Maine in 1987, a tiny warm water invasive known as Membrana pora membranacea appeared in the mighty sugar kelp forest that underpinned the Kalanus food web. 
the invasive began encasing kelp leaves in its tiny calcified skeletons until vast tracts of the plant were unable to eat or reproduce and literally disintegrated in the tide. And yet, despite an ocean of death and loss,